The first is how many of you, when you talk to friends and you tell them what you do, you do anthropology, what kind of answers do you all get? What are you gonna do? Like, <laughs> so like anybody say you get the like dinosaurs answer? Oh yeah. yeah. Any others? Bugs? Bugs. Like, yeah, I get bugs. Okay. Uh, what are you gonna do with that? Right? Like, what are you gonna do with that question? Right? It's really common. So there's that side of it, and that can be like, oh, okay, that's kind of intimidating. What does that mean? People don't know what it is. Um, and it happens, right? It happened to me too. I used to like I have family members that are dinosaurs, right? And I, some of them I just gave up. Yes. <laughs> dinosaurs and they're awesome. Yes. Um, but and this this is actually kind of good to know. Um, anthropology. It's an interesting thing. Like when you talk to your friends or and start telling people what you do, how many of them seem interested once you start explaining what you do? It's pretty common. Yeah. So there's two common things going on here. It's pretty common for people to go, what is that, right? And then when you start telling them what it is, a lot of people are really interested. I have experience with that because I've taught a lot of anthropology and I've taught a lot of non-anthropology students. And I've had so many students, so I've taught since 2008 or something, I don't know. Um, and I've had so many students say, non-anthropology, how come I've never heard of this before? Really interested in this field, I mean consistently year after year. Same thing outside of academia. People are really interested in what anthropologists do. They don't always know what we do, but that's okay. <laughs> so part of it is, um, if you're looking into grad school, um, you don't face that quite as much, right? But if you're going into the, the, the professional world or into the job market, it's good to keep in mind, okay, um, not everybody's necessarily gonna know what anthropology is. So part of it is learning how to tell people what you do and how to start connecting it to the kind of stuff that they're doing. Whether it's cultural resource management, whether it's journalism, whether it's law, right? There's actually a lot that anthropology can connect with. Um, and so one of my suggestions is, when you start thinking and looking into what you wanna do, um, environmental science, uh, you know, cultural resource management, uh, go, to, go into museums, go into doing uh, um, like legal work, any whatever field it is, you start learning about that, that field and you learn about the sort of connections that there are with anthropology and you learn how to make some of those bridges. That's one of my arguments that I tell a lot of undergraduates is, um, anthropology connects well with a lot of different things. So the sooner you start looking at how and where do I wanna specialize, that's how you can start building up those connections. Like an example would be, if you're interested in health and healthcare, um, Veronica, my wife, she does medical anthropology. This is one aspect of cultural anthropology that has many academic and non-academic applications. Many. So with public health, um, with state, um, uh, there's a lot of jobs in state and federal jobs, but there's also a lot of research jobs. One, for example, would be like Kaiser Permanente. They are hiring a lot of um, MA and PhDs. And the sooner you know what they're looking for, the better. Okay, so that's one example. Um, and there can be various sorts of skills that you add onto it that when you know what they're looking for, if they're looking for um, quantitative like research methods, the sooner you know, the better. And the way to do it is start looking at the kinds of jobs you think you wanna get and look at the requirements they're asking for. Like I do this all the time. I do, like I would look on USA Jobs, there's one site where there's tons of federal jobs, usajobs.gov, all over the country. And you start searching for the kinds of jobs you want and then go and pay really close attention to, to all of the expectations and requirements right? and then see where you're at. And there's things that you can do to sort of add in that experience. And then you can start tailoring whether you're taking an extra certificate, right? You're doing an extra like GIS or something like that, or you're doing an internship where you're trying to fill in those areas so you can nail those jobs. And so, like earlier this year, I came really close to actually accepting a job with NOAA, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. Um, they just gave me a really crazy timeline and we decided, okay, this is a little crazy, but I was close. But I'm telling you this because there's a little story to it. I applied to um, another kind of division of NOAA in Seattle, and I went through the whole process and I learned from the process about what to do and what not to do. And this is definitely the difference between the academic world and sort of the professional kind of job market and even like um, research institutions. Like NOAA tends to be part government, part research institute, right? And when I first applied to this one in Seattle, um, I, with the, the resume that I wrote up, there was a couple things that I didn't quite nail correctly. And I didn't get that, I didn't get offered that position. Um, and so what I did was I really looked through what they want. I looked through the kind of researchers that work with them and I looked at the experience that I had. I said, oh, okay, they really have a strong sort of quantitative analysis component going on. It's not that I didn't have those skills. It's that, and this is a key part for resumes. What resumes are all about, they're short, right? Compared to this, an academic CV, a resume is, I mean, two pages max. If you can get it on one page, all the better. But like two pages maximum and a resume is short. You don't wanna have it filled in with a ton of stuff. And some of the best advice I've seen, um, a really good person to look into for like free online advice. She also wrote a book that's pretty affordable, but her name is Karen Kelsky. She's a, she was the um, chair of an anthropology department for about eight years, and now she does, um, her whole gig now is consultation, uh, people going either continuing in academia or going into the professional world, and she, she talks about cover letters and CVs and resumes and all this stuff. So she's a really good, she's a good resource, it's online, she has tons of stuff for free, and then she actually does some other stuff that's like paid consultations. I've used all this stuff for free, and it's really helped a lot. One thing she says though about, and this applies, I would, I would say this applies to both CVs and resumes, but what she says is, she sees white space on your resume as confidence. Like rather than trying to extend the margins and like 
jam everything in under the sun. She says you gotta be concise with it, right? And you gotta really think through what you're putting on there. And, and like if you look, um, Dr. Brazier, we talked about it for a minute, but another good example or a good idea is to look at various resumes out there. And I think her advice, and I've seen some kind of impacts in, in my own, like my first resume used to be just like, I don't know, I'll just list everything I can possibly think of and just, right? And then maybe put a narrative up top, right? Um, and it, it can be kind of, the, the trick is you have to realize that a lot of times they're going through a lot of different people. So you have to find a way to, again, tailor it and get right to it. And so resumes, the other thing about resumes is, um, as opposed to, to the curriculum vitae, which translates to, that means um, the course of one's life. That's what it means, right? The course of your life. A CV is actually about your whole sort of academic career. Um, and in the US, CVs tend to be quite a bit longer. In um, Europe, the, the sort of the, a little more of a trend is like a two page, but in, in the United States, CVs can be, I mean, I know some academics who have like a 25 page CV. And I don't know how common that is, but I know some people have just extremely long CVs and this, they're putting everything on there, all publications, all service, and it's this long extended sort of track record of everything you've done presentations, publications, all education, right? That's a CV. A resume is not that. A resume is gonna focus on um, education, but the big thing that, res that resumes are trying to get across are skills. And so my story about applying for NOAA and the Pacific Island Fisheries Science Center and the one up in Seattle is, that's where I learned, at least I learned, you know, in that kind of turnaround was, they wanna know what's your training and what can you do? Meaning like, are you trained in GIS? Are you trained in qualitative data analysis? Are you trained in lab analysis? So the other part for you all, is, is this, and this is sometimes the hard part, you don't always know all the skills that you have, right? So if you work in a lab, like doing curation, doing analysis, that's something that you highlight. Any kind of experience that you've done, you find a way to highlight it on your resume. And then the other thing about a resume is it's pretty short, and what you end up doing is you end up having a master resume, like a main primary one that's sort of general, and then every job, you tweak it every time. Every job, you tweak little parts of it to sort of appeal to what that job is. So there may be cases where you're focusing more on your field work, right? You're, you're really pulling that up. There may be cases where you're focusing on your lab work. There may be cases where your the position is really asking for qualitative, a qualitative researcher. And in that case, you'll find ways to highlight your um, like either the classes or the, the experience that you have. Now, um, the other thing is sometimes one end of the spectrum is when you're first starting out, I don't know, this may be the case. When I first started writing resumes, I was like, oh, I don't know what to put on there, right? So that, and that's another reason why sometimes, like some of the, and I did this on my first resume, sometimes it is good to have that sort of kind of narrative thing on top, right? That can help to, to kind of talk about what you've done and what you want to do, and you put your education, and then you can talk about work experience, right? Work and research or any kind of academic experience, um, if it's relevant. So don't worry too much. Um, and I've actually worked with um, several students here already on resumes, and sometimes it's easy to get really worried about it. Just make it clean and, and start working on um, tweaking it and focusing it towards each particular job. And part of that means going through and looking at those jobs consistently and seeing what they want. That really helps a lot. And then when you get called for interviews, um, it also helps, it really helps, you know, you don't wanna go too overboard with it, but when it's, when you're saying like, like I would do in the case of the Pacific Island uh, uh, Science Center on, in Hawaii, when I could talk about some of the projects that they're working on. Oh yeah, I've done some ethnographic research in Baja California working with uh, communities of fishermen and we started talking about um, land rights and it, it really relates to some of the projects you all are, are starting to build and I can see myself working on it. See what I'm talking about? So sometimes if you get to the interview stage and you've done your homework, you can throw little bits and pieces in there. So the resume is actually just, just trying to get you in the door. And your, but your homework begins there, and it's all strategy. And so my overall advice for resumes is concise, tailored, right, and white space is confident. Like don't feel like you just gotta have like, like just build up the stuff. So that's the resume side of things. Um, and CVs are actually kind of similar. Um, I don't know, do you guys want me to show you what mine looks like? Yeah. Is there a, oh yeah. Well, I was using this recording. Oh, oops. Does anyone have a laptop that they can plug in real quick? Oh, the opinion so I, I agree with everything Dr. Anderson said and um, <laughs> we're on board I think I mean you have some decisions to make I think if you're gonna go in a CV is more for an academic yep. right and so if you're gonna go to grad school either to get an MA and or a PhD and a PhD or you know or just an MA you need to have a CV right and um, so if you're gonna apply for teaching jobs if you want to you know adjunct teach somewhere you have to have a CV and the reason people at your stage in your career don't do CVs is because you think you have nothing to put there 
Uh, it, it doesn't matter. My CV is 22 pages long. When I was where you were at, it was like a half a page long. Yeah. It is a record of everything you've done in your career. And if you don't start it now, you're going to miss stuff, right? And so it's no one expects you to have a CV five pages long. But what you, you want to just start it, and you don't want to fill it in with fluff, right? Just if it's short, it's short, right? I mean, no one expects you guys um, as undergraduate students or recently graduated BAs to, to have a lot to put down. But what you want to do, what you do want to put down, it's like start off with your contact information, your educational stuff, where your current position is, any sort of like honors, like you know you graduated with honors or you know or whatever, or, or you were president of a club or treasurer, whatever, right? Or a member of the student organization, this club here, all that can go on, right? Um, the kinds of classes you've taken, your interests, right? And so there are lots of ways to do this. This mine is obviously tailored for being a professor. So I have my teaching, and then I have a ton on you know publications and research. You guys aren't going to have that yet, uh, but you will have things like um, field school experience, like field experience, right? You can list those in just like one line, like what project it was, what years you were doing it, um, uh, where it was, right, and who the PI of that, who was directing that project. So all that stuff goes on there, and it just gets added to. Like honestly, every month. I'm putting something else on my CV. I've done something, I'm on a new committee, I get another paper published, whatever, I have a student graduate, it all goes on my CV. On my CV. It's just, it's a living document that follows you around, right? Um, so you need one of these if you have any idea that you may get going to graduate school. If you don't think you're gonna do it now, I would say start this so you have it, and then if you apply to a graduate program, this is a great thing to have. Um, yeah. the, and then there are a ton, of, there's no template that we can give you for a CV or a resume. You just need to go find faculty members. Most of them post their CVs. Look at how they do it. I mean, like a, a, a resume, it needs to be pleasing, right? You need to look at it, be able to easily follow it. It doesn't have fluff. It doesn't have too much text. It just lays out your history. And it's consistent. Yeah. Like you pick a format and just stick with it. Yeah. And not a lot of mixing of formats, like jumping back from bullet point to this or that. Yeah. Just sort of go with the format. Right. And then like you have to have a font that looks neat and clean. And so just pick, you know, this mine is based on one that I found of one of my advisors when I was a PhD student, uh, what theirs looked like. And I liked the way they laid it out. So that's how I laid mine out, right? Um, every one of my colleagues, including Dr. Anderson, probably has a different format for their CV. It, you know, and it's all just sort of what your taste is. Um, do you ever do you advise people to, um, to tailor them a little bit depending on the position? Uh, so for a CV, yes. But I mean, this sort of gets into, for both, right? You should tailor it for the position. Um, however, I think there's less tailoring that has to be done on a CV. Yeah. And the only difference is like when I if, when I was applying for jobs, the jobs that I was applying for that were more teaching universities, right? This is kind of a research university. The teaching universities, I would move all the teaching stuff up front and push all the publications down below. It was just a reformatting, right? It was a cut and paste. Um, and so I was just trying to emphasize the, the teaching, right? And then when it's a research job, I know that the thing they're most interested in is research productivity. So I arrange it like that. But you know, the, the components really don't change. Uh, the CV is more tailored, I think, because that, or a resume, a resume yeah. excuse me, a resume is more tailored for the position, right? Because essentially a resume is a job application. I mean, you're gonna have to write a letter and you're gonna have to probably apply, but they are gonna take your resume and in two pages, if it has the skills laid out that they're interested in, you go to the look further pile. If not, you probably go to the not considered pile. And it happens very quickly, right? And so it's a really important document. Yeah. I kind of, sometimes I look at the CV as like the big sort of database, and then you pull for the resume, you can pull pieces here and there. And the only tailoring I've known, the same thing with the CV, is depending on if it's a research focus or a teaching focus, you'll sometimes just shift those parts. Yeah. Otherwise, it's kind of this running document that you keep going, and the resumes tend to be, like I have, for resumes I have, multiple files that I have going. I mean, like I had one that I sent a few years ago to KPBS was looking for somebody to fill in doing like uh, fronteras, the border reporting. And I, and I, it's a specific one where I, that, in that case, I have a photography background. I'll pull that all up and emphasize all that kind of stuff. And so you'll have like um, that running CV file and all these other resume files. Um, and you kind of look at it as, as you know, an ongoing sort of process that you keep adding to. Yeah, I guess for the CV too, for, for you guys, for the CV, right? Um, one of the things that's gonna be really important for you to get into grad programs, if that's the way you go, is field and lab experience, right? Everyone who applies for those, for an MA or a PhD, everyone that has a chance, right, has a BA in anthropology or related field, right? And they probably have decent grades, right? It, it ranges, but they probably have decent grades and they probably made the minimum GRE scores, right? So you need to distinguish yourself. And hanging your hat on the fact that you took some class is not gonna do it, it's, it's not gonna do it, right? No one cares what specific, I mean, we care, 